All right. So welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Lowers. I'm the founder and CEO of BirdBrain Technologies. And I'm inviting you all to a Finch 2 playground. So you'll get to uh, program the finches and play with them. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction here with a slideshow. Um, so I wanted to start by introducing our director of operations, Aparna. Aparna, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hello, I'm Parna, I'm the Director of Operations. I have written emails with many of you. Um, a lot of you probably don't know this, but we are a tiny team. So we're only seven people. So when you write one of us, you're really getting direct to the source. And uh, we really appreciate everyone being patient as we've developed these finches. Um, and we are really, really excited to show them to you. We are really excited for you to get your hands on with them a little bit today. Um, I see Audra here from Massachusetts. We're going to be presenting at a conference that she's organizing, and we're super excited about that. Um, so I just wanted to say hello and say how much we appreciate you coming here to learn about the Finches and spreading the word for us, because really, for our team, what you think is really important. These, these were built based on your feedback. And some of you, literally your feedback. So Kay is on the line. She was a Finch robot loan program. I have literally read every piece of feedback that a Finch loan teacher has given. And that's over a thousand teachers. And so we really took that feedback into account when building the Finch 2. Um, and so we really um, designed it for you and we can't wait to get it into your literal hands um, and hear what you think. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Aparna. And I mean, in, so you can, for those of you who do not know, Aparna runs our loan program. Um, so the Finch Robot Loan Program is a program where you can apply to borrow free loans of the robots if you are a school teacher or librarian. And so um, yeah, we're going to be looking at getting the Finch crews into that loan program just as soon as we can, as, hopefully as early as early next year. Um, so, I wanted to give you a brief introduction to the Finch Robot 2.0, and then I also wanted to talk a little bit separately about remote robots, which is the technology that we've developed since March to allow you to program these robots remotely over the internet. Um, and that works both with the Finch as well as with uh, BirdBrain's other product, the Hummingbird Kit. Uh, I then want to give some basic rules uh, and instructions for how to program the robots. And then uh, the rest of the presentation really is all about you getting a chance to program these robots remotely uh, while also um, giving you the opportunity to ask us questions about anything related to uh, the Finch, about programming them, but also about logistics, uh, classroom integration, um, and also about the hummingbird. So really anything to do with bird brain technologies, we'll be happy to answer. Uh, and some questions about. Um, so here's the link, of, link to the slides if you want to follow along. Um, I'll also obviously be navigating through them. So in your Zoom window, if you're, if you're set to um, bird brain technologies, to me, you can see them pretty clearly. All right, so what is the Finch 2 about? It's really about um, creating a tool for computer science and computational thinking education that spans the gamut from kindergarten to college. And the way we do that is we support various different programming experience levels through icon, block, and text-based environments. The Finch 2 is obviously based on the original Finch, which was developed at Carnegie Mellon in the late 2000s. Um, but it really gave us the opportunity to integrate you know, 10 years of feedback about the original Finch, as well as update it to meet you know, 2020 hardware um, requirements and capabilities. I mean, a lot has happened in the last 10 years in the world of hardware, so it really allowed us to, to make a lot of improvements as well. Um, right now, if you pre-order right now, we're promising a ship date of December. Uh, as I mentioned earlier before, um, before the recording started, for those of you who have placed pre-orders, uh, right now it's looking like early to mid-November for when we will be shipping those out to you. Um, 
So that's the Finch. So let me talk a little bit about the features. I am, you know, I am an engineer, so I like to geek out about, about these different things. Um, so it's a differential drive. That means it has two wheels that can move and turn. Um, those wheels have encoders, which means that they know how far they've turned. So you can give the Finch commands like go 10 centimeters, turn 90 degrees, draw a square, that kind of thing. It has an LED in its beak and four LEDs, uh, quite bright, full color LEDs in its tail. Um, so that's really fun because you can put different patterns on those tail LEDs. It also has an LED array that is embedded in the BBC micro bit, which is what the Finch is kind of built around. It has a, a buzzer that can play multiple tones. It has a marker holder or pen holder in the center of the robot so that you can draw shapes very easily. Um, and, and make them, you know, clearly, uh, clearly work out. And then it has a plastic brick adapter, which allows us to, allows you to basically customize your Finch, add things to it, um, add different, you know, perhaps well-known plastic bricks to it, um, as well as potentially future accessories, mechanical accessories. And then in terms of inputs, it has line sensors on the bottom, so it can track a line, it has a uh, ultrasound distance sensor, sensor in the front, um, two light sensors that are kind of buried in the plastic but are to either side of the beak. Um, and then the micro bit has a compass, an accelerometer, and buttons. So that allows you to do different things with those, with those sensors. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the durability of the design. And uh, Matt from Dell, who helped us with the industrial design, is actually on the call. Um, and one of the things that he came up with was, was this idea of um, spring loading the, the, like creating a mini suspension. And that means that if you step on the finch, the motors, the wheels actually just retract into the body. And so, you know, this is an example of the kind of feedback that we got over 10 years. One of the most common failure modes of the original Finch was somebody stepped on it and that would cause the wheels to kind of splay out and break a little bit. Um, so that can't happen with this Finch. I stepped on it on our slate floor and it was fine. Um, we also ran it off tables quite frequently while testing the design just to make sure it was okay. Um, another thing that we built was around was a very long lasting battery. So we wanted to make sure that one finch on one charge would work for an entire school day. And we've definitely achieved that. Um, it works for seven hours. If you run the motors and lights full speed, top intensity the whole time. So really, realistically, I'm thinking more like 12 to 15 hours in a in regular kind of classroom operation. And then it comes with tons of activities. So we've been spending the last year creating learning materials around the Finch 2. Um, you'll get to preview some of those. They're not complete, but they're, they're getting very close. Um, and that includes a professional development course, coding tutorials for students and for you, um, and also over 30 activities that you can use with the Finch. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, the Finch is built around the BBC Microbit which is this awesome little device for physical computing education. Uh, there are millions of them out in the world, and it's really a, a great, it, it provides a great way to continue using it. It also provides a way for, you know, us to sort of future-proof the Finch because the micro bit is removable. So, you know, if, if there are future generations, we can update kind of the processing power of the Finch. All right, so that's the Finch. So let me now also talk about remote robots, which, as I mentioned, is something that we developed in March when we realized that the pandemic would cause uh, long-term shutdowns of, of schools and libraries and museums. And so we were thinking, you know, here at BirdBrain, what could we do to, um, to, you know, help with this situation? And one solution that we came up with was this idea of remotely programming your robots over the internet. Um, and so this works, as I mentioned, with both the Finch and the Hummingbird kit. And it is built in the, the case, in the type that you are going to be using, it is built on a, an existing tool called Netsblocks, which is itself based on the SNAP programming environment. And Netsblocks basically adds kind of networking to SNAP. Um, and so, you know, what are we trying to do here? Well, imagine that I have a robot in Pittsburgh 
and my extended family lives in Belgium. So they are, you know, I want them to be able to program my robot in Pittsburgh. It's as simple as that. Um, and so we've we figured out how to do that and you're going to be uh, using it very soon. Um, so the way it works roughly is on your end, you're going to get a link that you can use to program the finches. If you click a block in that programming environment, like a finch move block, it sends a message over the internet to a project that I'm running locally on a couple of computers here in the studio. And then that project actually passes a message over Bluetooth to the finch robot. Um, three finches can con connect to one computer. So I have six here in the studio and I have two computers that are running those six robots. What's really cool is this also works in reverse. So if I have a, let's say a light sensor reading that goes over Bluetooth to the local project here, and then that goes over the internet to you and you can read that light sensor or distance sensor. And what that means is you can actually program these robots to do simple behaviors like following a, a beam of light, um, reacting if I cover it with my hand here in the studio, which you can ask me to do if you if you need me to activate your sensor and somehow I'm happy to do that. Or, you know, avoiding the wall or things like that. You can actually build that kind of program even remotely. Um, all right, so let's talk about how you how you do this. So um, we're going to click on this link, which Aparna can also put into the chat. And this is sort of a link that contains a few instructions on how to run the robots remotely. Um, so we recommend you open these, uh, the link to program the robots in the Chrome browser. Um, so here it is. Please like kind of read through these instructions. Um, so I'm going to click on them on the link. Okay, so now you see a programming interface, which if you've used Snap or Scratch programming before, this is going to look fairly familiar to you. It's a, essentially a blocks-based um, programming environment. The first thing you wanna do to uh, program a robot is connect to it. And you can do that here by either pressing the C key on your keyboard, C as in cat, or um, clicking on this set of blocks. And that's going to connect you to a robot and it's going to tell you which robot in the canvas here. So it'll say connected to Finch A. And then you'll actually see um, a little bit of a dashboard here. Oh, thought I connected. Okay. You'll see a little bit of a dashboard here that shows, um, so shows those sensor values and they are updating uh, in real time. And then you can test a little sample program that we've created here. So if I do that, it's moving my finch and you can actually see that moving, you know, in the top view over here. Um, all right. You can also take some blocks and, you know, edit that program or start your own program. It's up to you. The blocks for the finch are all at the bottom of the different categories that they're in. So the motion blocks, they're going to be at the bottom of the motion category. The LED blocks will be at the bottom of the looks category. Uh, there's a buzzer that'll be at the bottom of the sound. And then there's sensing that'll be at the bottom of this, or different sensors that'll be at the bottom of the sensing category. The other blocks all have to do with creating animations just like in Scratch or Snap in the, in the canvas. So don't get fooled. I think one of the most common mistakes is, you know, having it move 10 steps, that's going to move your sprite, not your finch. If you want to move your finch, click take a finch move block and move it that way. Okay. Um, one of the cool things that you can do with this, since there are many of us in this call, is if you disconnect from the robot and you do that by pressing the X key or clicking on this set of blocks, um, you can continue editing your program, you know, and just changing things as you want. And then when you're done editing and you want to see how it works, you can click C again and reconnect uh, and, and run your program. So I recommend that you kind of connect and disconnect as um, because there are, are quite a few of you since there's only six robots, please do kind of please follow that that method. Um, so 
connect, you know, or change your program, connect to run it, disconnect when you're when you have when you need some time to think again to kind of um, you know update the program or try something new. Um, all right, so make sure you so I'm going to disconnect so that I'm not hogging uh, Finch A. Um, if I'm going back to this page and there's a quick orientation video which I've just gone through, um, so you probably don't need to watch that. Here's a description of all the snap blocks, um, which tells you kind of, you know, like what numbers to put in the Finch beak block to make it go or, you know, what, how the distance sensor works and what, what range to expect from that. There's also some programming tutorials and then some suggested activities. So this is sort of a preview of our, um, of our educational materials as well. So please feel free to take a look at those, maybe try out the dance bot or the spirals or the squirrel bot. And then there's some troubleshooting instructions if something isn't working for you. And um, yeah, that's about it. I see some robots have already started moving. The last thing I wanted to say, so hi everybody. So in the BirdBrain studio, I can switch between different camera angles. Um, and I'm going to leave it on this top view. And so you can see the robots from, you know, from up above. There are two other cameras in the studio that you can click between using, using Zoom. So if you double click, if you go to, if you change to speaker view and then double click on either Tom's iPhone or, or just Tom Lauer's, it'll switch to a different view. Now my iPhone is actually attached to, um, to Finch A. So it's a little point of view camera, which is really fun. Uh, and then my laptop is creating a side view over here. Um, this is actually a, a fairly useful tip just for um, any sort of hands-on, you know, learning, even if you were, say, doing a, a virtual art class, creating multiple camera angles using smartphones or tablets and calling, like, calling with all of them into a Zoom session um, can be very helpful, I think, in terms of providing your students with a different way to see something that you're doing, you know, with your hands. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Tom, we've got some great, great questions. So Brian Harvey, who knows all about SNAP. Hi, Brian, off in Berkeley, one of the creators of SNAP, um, asked, do these robots have markers in them? These and I think the, these, these do not, but I was wondering if you have any whiteboard markers in the studio and if that is a whiteboard that they're on, maybe if we could try that. So that does sound fun. All right, I, um, should, I should have brought my, uh, yeah, I should have brought mine from home. There have been some questions about um, what different programming languages they are and what languages work with different devices. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. So lots of people have asked whether the Finch 2 will work with iPads. And the answer is definitely yes. They work with iPads and Android, tablets, phones, um, anything of that nature. We have two apps. And I'll post the link again, but you can actually download and look at those apps now, even if you don't have a Finch 2. We uh, built a new app for the Finch called Finch Blocks, which is um, an app for pre-readers. So there are no words in this app. We're imagining it being used from K to 3. There's three different levels of progressing difficulty. So you can introduce more CS and CT concepts, again, to your youngest students. Um, the second app that works with Tablets and phones is Bird Blocks, which some of you may have already used with the Hummingbird. So same app, it is based on Scratch, so very similar to Scratch or Snap, except built for tablets and phones. Uh, next question about Chromebooks. So yes, we have lots of options for Finch 2 and Chromebooks. So um, the first one is Make Code which is um, language from Microsoft, and that works because the Finch is powered by the microbit. Um, also, Snap and Python, we have web apps that work in, for Chromebooks. Um, and then people ask for laptops and desktops, so yes, 
Hello, Javier, wherever you are, another French loan person. Um, so definitely for your laptops and desktops, Java, Python, Snap, make code. I'm missing something. I forgot which one I didn't say, but yes, all the standard languages work for laptops and desktops. And yes, I will post a link to the apps. Um, and did do, I'm going to post it for the Apple Store, but I can um, post them for all three if people want to see it in Android or in uh, Fire OS. Um, I do have a question. Do these sites work for the original Finch? And I'm not sure if a person could elaborate what they mean by sites. I will be able to answer you. And Eileen, hello Eileen, another French loan person, asked um, if how they can you can learn to set this up. So again, just a second, I'll, I'll send a link to a page that, again, all of this remote robots is brand new. So we started doing this once the pandemic hit, once schools shut down. Um, so we have just started building these capabilities starting in April. So these pages are ongoing. But yes, you can do remote robots yourself, of course, with Finch 2s, as we're showing here, but also with Finch 1, so the original Finches, which I know a lot of you have. Um, so we were planning, in other playgrounds, people have asked for a webinar on how to set up remote robots with their Finch 2s. And we are planning that for the end of November, once everyone has their Finch 2s. But people should let me know in the chat and if they are interested in another webinar on how to set up remote robots with your Finch ones. So if lots of you have Finch ones already and you want to learn how to set those up remotely, we can do a separate webinar on that. Um, and I'm going to mute myself for a second and start posting a few links in the chat. People should feel free to unmute themselves and ask questions. Both Tom and I will hear, one of us will answer, or maybe another teacher will answer since we have a lot of expert Finch users here today. Oh, and I wanted to add, I put a marker in Finch C. So whoever has C, we'll see how it draws. It's not the type that we would, that we are planning to uh, acquire for it. We actually found the perfect marker very recently, um, but it is a Crayola washable, standard Crayola washable. So um, see if you can draw some shapes with that. Oh, now, if any of you are trying to use sensors, um, just some kind of hints. If you're trying to make like an obstacle avoider, um, because you know this information is going over the internet, it's it tends to react less rapidly than if you were doing this, you know, at your own house. Um, so for example, the distance sensor, what I recommend in terms of making an obstacle avoider, wow, E is really going crazy. Um, what I recommend in terms of making an obstacle avoider is to drive fairly slowly uh, and set the threshold uh, pretty high. So like if the distance is less than 30, start backing up because it takes about a second for the distance sensor information to go to your laptop. And then uh, it takes about another second for you to send that command back to the robot to tell it to, you know, move backwards. And in two seconds, if you're moving fast, your finch is probably already bumped into a wall. How do you disconnect? Uh, so you would hit the X key on your keyboard or click on this um, the set of blocks that say when X pressed, and that disconnects the robot or disconnects you from the robot. And if anybody is, is stuck or can't disconnect, um, just let me know. I can do that manually on my end also. Hi, this is Bart. I have a question. Hi, Bart. Go ahead. Um, concerning Bluetooth, in your documentation, you said um, it states uh, Bluetooth dongle required for pre-2014 Max. So anything older than a 2014 is not going to work? We have, um, we have a Bluetooth dongle that should actually work with those. Um, so we're, we've been using a Bluetooth dongle 
and uh, that is the way to support really old Macs as well as actually many Windows machines. Okay, I'm I'm always looking for an excuse to upgrade my hardware. That's why I asked. <laughs> well, it's probably still a good idea. <laughs> I didn't mean to take your excuse away. <laughs> Thank you. How do you tell again, um, like, where on the programming do you see which one you would be manipulating, which Finch you would be manipulating? So when you first connect, it will say connected to Finch something, like A, B, C, D, or E, or F. Okay. Um, let me see if there's a way to show that also. Yeah, so you kind of have to see which one you've got right then, right when you connect. Um, so right now we haven't made a simulator and we honestly aren't planning, planning to right now. Um, we put more more work into kind of making this or making remote robots or one-to-one -one robotics work. Um, I mean, honestly, like this may be a philosophical thing, but for me, once you remove the the robot, uh, I think you get as much out of you know code.org or Scratch or any other type of of kind of animation and media programming environment. So the simulator seems less useful to me at that point. And definitely keep the questions coming. If there was a link you were looking for and I didn't get to you in the chat or it went too far up, just let me know. I'll post it again. Eileen, I don't think uh, I, I couldn't hear that. It's too quiet. I'm sorry. Did she post a link yet for it, like creating if we wanted to create our own labs? I know she said something about in November, but I didn't know if there was something else to learn how to create a lab like this, a remote lab. No, nope, I will post that right now. Thank you. I knew I had forgotten something. Uh, minimum space for a playground on how much area for each robot. Those are great questions. So we're in, like this particular, um, you know, playground that I built is four feet by four feet. I think that that probably is pretty close to your minimum. Um, Eileen, who is on the call, Eileen Malik, uh, is going to test a swimming pool, I think like a kid's blow up swimming pool, which seemed like a good idea. We'll see how the surface does. Um, but like in terms of creating walls, yeah, there's cut it to see your view. Um, in terms of creating walls easily, it's, it's much easier than, than building it out of wood like I do. Um, so I think, I think it's a pretty great idea. Uh, but yeah, some, somewhere around four feet by four feet, I think is probably appropriate. And then there's six robots in here. Um, I am kind of moving them around a little bit. There are a lot of collisions. I mean, it doesn't hurt the robots or anything for them to collide, so it doesn't really matter, but um, I think that works. And we had a great question in the chat about the learning materials. So that is really an important part. And um, if the, the library posts just what languages you're thinking about, I'm going to send you links. But in the next week or so, our website is going to be updated with Finch 2.0, and you will be able to see all the learning materials that are going to be available. So for every programming language, we will have a series of tutorials, step-by-step -step tutorials on how to program, how to use every output and input with the Finch. 
obviously those will vary in depth based on the programming language. We have all of those up now, um, so I can send you links in the chat, but like I said, in about a week, it'll go public on the website. We're just putting the finishing touches on that now. Um, and in addition to these programming tutorials, we then have activities. So suggestions for fun activities that you can do with your finches, and with each of that, each of those activities, we'll tell you which programming tutorials you will have to cover. So for instance, for finch dance party, once you know how to move the finch and light up the finch, then you can have a finch dance party, which is a real favorite of folks who've been using the finch ones. Um, and this ranges, all of these things are available from finch blocks, which is our icon based app, all the way up to Java. So we have something, we have these, these materials available for free for every language. Hi, this is Rex. Can I ask what's the uh, sensors that Bill put on top and he added on uh, the uh, Finch A? I'm looking at that. Is it carrying a cell phone or something like that? Yeah, so Finch A, I didn't hear all of that, but Finch A is, is um, you know, I have actually my kids built a little like phone mount out of Legos. So kind of show that from the top view or the side view over here. Oh yeah, um, and it's holding my iPhone, and that iPhone is called into Zoom, um, so that way you get this cool little point of view camera uh, to play with. Oh yeah, that's right. Because on on top it's like the on top of the Finch Two, it builds with a Lego type of setup, right? Very good, thank you. Yeah, so there's a a block grid, um, like to to put basic Legos on. Yeah, so some of the activities that were really fun with the Finch One is we had a lot of people who were very creative about building things onto their Finches. So they would play Finch soccer and sometimes they would build little, the kids would decide to win, they would build little scoops on the front of their Finch so that they could collect more balls or be more aggressive. Um, and so we created a lot of activities for Finch too. That's why we built the Lego plate. Also the pen mount pole can be used to put in a popsicle stick or a straw or something else that you can then use to build things. So one of the activities that we were testing out at conferences earlier this year when you could physically go to conferences was Finch jousting. So you, know, you have a Finch and you have a target, for instance, like a cup with a ping pong ball on top of it. And the kids have to figure out how to program their Finch you know, build something on their finch so that they can hit the target and get to the target. So measurement, distance, all sorts of great, you know, tie-ins to the curriculum there and just super fun. Someone was mentioning the costumes. So we really like costumes. That was like one of our funnest parts about Finch One. People would dance, dress them up and have dance parties. Uh, we had a school do a whole jazz unit where every finch got dressed up as a different jazz singer and was involved in a very uh, interactive multimedia presentation. Um, and so we're hoping that both the central marker hole as well as the Lego plate will really enable a lot of creativity um, and just that extra level of physicality so you can build things onto your finch to accomplish engineering tasks. I see somebody asked about the marker. Um... So there's a marker hole in the center, and on Finch C, it's actually, um, there's a Crayola washable that's just in there. Um, so if you program Finch C to move around, um, you should be able to draw a shape, like make it draw a square or a triangle. Um, now that marker hole can support most types of markers and pens. Um, we have found that the Crayola washable with a paintbrush tip creates the best lines. So that's what we're going to be recommending for it. And uh, what else can I say about the marker hole? Uh, it's in the center and that way, you know, it, it can draw shapes quite, quite easily. All right, I see C is move, starting to move here. Uh, let me adjust it.
And I'm going to post in the chat a link to our lessons. So I'm just going to pick bird blocks. Um, you need to bear with us because we are still in the process of perfecting these. So like I said, we're seven people, and so I currently have my team going through each programming language and doing all of the activities. And so every time they come up with some little tweak, we're updating everything. So um, check out these ones for bird blocks. They're going to be quite similar for Snap and MakeCode, which are languages that are, you know, fairly at the same level. And if you if you look at them, you'll see they start very basic, right? They tell you how to move the finch forward, how to turn the light on, things that you guys have figured out just from playing around for a few minutes on the playground, and things that your students are going to figure out in just a few minutes. But if you keep going down those lessons and you go to going further and you look at some of those, you'll see that really in the block-based languages, and uh, Brian Harvey will definitely back me up on this because he has a whole fantastic article about this, which I'm also going to put in the chat, that block-based languages are not baby languages and they go very deep and there are a lot of really deep things that you can do in block-based programming. And so that is really one of our core tenets. We want things to be low floor, but we really, really want to build products that are high ceiling. So for us, yes, that includes being able to program in standard Java and Python so that you can use it for APCSA. Um, it also means in the design um, that we wanted something that was appealing to little kids, but not too cute that a high school or introductory college student would be turned off, that they would still be engaged and want to interact with the robots. Um, but it also means that in our block-based programming tutorials, even though we know that lots of people don't necessarily get to them, that you have options to learn things that are deep um, and that you can see really the options that are available in these programming languages. I think uh, favorite new feature. Well, I mean, the one that everybody wanted and that I'm excited about also is not having you, a USB cable um, and having, you know, a Bluetooth connection or autonomous mode for programming the finches. Um, but I think in addition to that, or what that really meant for me was being able to make the finch move precisely. And so I would add that as my favorite new feature also. It really led to a lot of different things, right? A precise movement, which allowed us to put a marker hole in the center and make that, you know, really robust. Um, so I would say all of it, all of that, um, all of the implications from that. Now the USB tether on the original Finch, it, I think it was the right design choice in 2009 when we were designing the original Finch. If you tried to use Bluetooth devices back then, it was quite messy. And we really, really wanted to support Java and Python, standard Java and Python programming on the original Finch. And so the USB tether was the right way to do that. But it's, uh, it's good to see that in 2020, you know, Technology is caught up behind yeah, the Finch leash. That's right. And one thing that was a plus about having the tether is that there were no batteries to run out. So someone did ask earlier in the chat about the battery. So the battery life of the Finch is seven plus hours. And that's if you're running everything all the time. So really, the fish should very easily, the battery should last a full school day of use. So our thought process behind that was that teachers would want to, we could recharge it overnight. But we really wanted to make sure that it would definitely last for the whole school day, no matter what you wanted to do with them. And yes, NetBlox works with Finch 1 and 2, so you can set up remote robots with your Finch 1 robots. And I'll put that link in the chat again. 
the the only difference between the two is that for Finch one, the ratio is one robot to one laptop. And for Finch two, you can control three robots with one laptop. So you do need more more laptops essentially to do the same thing that we would be doing here. And yes, I agree with the poster about Brian's article being amazing, and we're super lucky to have him on here. So it was very exciting for me when I saw that he had registered for the webinar. So thank you, Brian. All right. Uh, who has robot C is a question Brian, Brian is asking because he wants it to draw. Uh, so if you have it, maybe consider disconnecting. It's the only one that I can't see if it's connected or not because of the tail. The microbit display actually tells me, yeah, somebody's definitely connected to it. Um, okay, thank you. Tom, we are getting a few questions about Finch 1 remote robots. So maybe you want to just say a few words about how they differ from Finch 2. Um, so with Finch 1, you know, basically the remote robot thing works with any robot that is supported in SNAP. So that's all of ours plus a few others that are out there. If you know, if you also do the work of making it work in NetSpots. Um, with the Finch one, what you would do is you would uh, launch the BirdBrain robot server, um, which is what you use to program it in SNAP. And then you, you know, with the BirdBrain robot server open, you would open Nets blocks and you'd be able to kind of follow the instructions to make your your Finch one remotely. So it actually works very similarly to how the Finch two works. Um, like I said, the only difference is that you can only have one Finch connected to the laptop. All right, I think C is moving. Okay, so Nets blocks, great questions. Um, so NetsBlocks is a, is a project at Vanderbilt where they kind of took SNAP, which is open, so open source, and they added networking features. And the way that we are using NetsBlocks is when you open a NetsBlocks project, it kind of like registers itself and has, it, it, NetsBlocks gives, it, give that, gives that project a unique name. Um, and so, if that project then knows the name of the project here that I have open, then it can communicate with those projects. So they can send kind of messages back and forth. You do not need an account to program the Finches. All of you just opened it from a link. And once you opened it, it kind of created its own link. So, you know, when you're editing your version of the of the code, it's not interacting with anybody else's version. Um, you can create an account and then save that code to the cloud. You can also export it into an XML file. So that's very much like Snap in terms of what, what you can do in terms of saving and loading. And then if you were to set this up yourself, um, you would need to create an account. Like there's no way to get around creating an account if you want to be the one kind of hosting a remote robots session. Um, but making an account is free and easy, so it's not a big deal. Oh, I see some interesting shapes being drawn there. Oh, that's cool, Brian. Posted that just Brian. the triangle. <laughs> and just to give you a little insight on some of the other things we're working on. So like Tom said, we are hoping that any day the finches, which are just about finished in their production, are going to get on a boat and be on their way across the ocean to us. So we are now starting um, working on a phone cradle accessory. So if you really want to do a lot of work with the phone, if you want to do 
some more advanced computer vision. You probably don't just want to build something out of Lego or temporary on your finch. So we're working on a phone holder. We're also working on classroom packs that like the hummingbird will come with accessories, um, like a multi USB strip um, and come in packaging where you could carry multiples of those. So we're working on those things now. Um, and we're very open to feedback. Like I said, almost everything we built into the Finch was a result of feedback, some directly from some of you. So if you guys have suggestions or things you want, when you look through the materials, if there's something you're looking for and you can't find it, please, um, you know, when you send, even when you send an email to info at Bird Brain Technologies, you're really getting one of us. So um, we really do want to hear from you. Eileen, have you tried to set up a uh, remote Finch yet? Sorry, Eileen Malik. There's two Eileen's, both Finch loan people, so. <laughs> That's a name, by the way. Um, I have my pool. Um, I have my pool blown up. Um, the bottom is a little wrinkly, so I'll have to figure that out. But um, from a teacher friend, I got this Bunsen burner stand since we can't use Bunsen burners in our face-to-face -face classroom full time. Um, and then I can put my camera on top. Like I have a crap camera, but the, uh, a crap phone, but the camera's still good. So I can put that on top of my Bunsen burner as soon as I figure out. I'm thinking about taking out the bottom from the fence that I got. Um, is there an Expo marker that will work that will fit in here? Because my Expos are too fat. And I want to use Expos because I have a big whiteboard I can lay down on the ground and maybe cut the bottom out of the floor. There are thinner Expos. Um, and there is, for those of you who haven't seen the fence, which is most of you, there is a little rubber gasket inside that hole, which should hold that thinner Expo tight. Okay. If it doesn't, um, we had someone this summer try just taking it. He took a cue card and rolled it and put it around the top of his marker so that the top of the marker wouldn't wiggle. So that worked fine too. Yes, temperature sensor. I know Eileen. Eileen loves the temperature sensor, and that's the one thing we didn't keep. In tanks, in fish tanks, so they can take temperature, or they can perform experiments, temperature, um, for environmental classes as well as our regular classes. Oh. I'm guessing uh, robot E is a light follower, maybe? Or it's a little hard to tell. But it seemed to react to, um, to me shading one side. Or maybe not. All right, we have a question about how to remote into a Finch. So um, Aparna will put the link to the Finch instructions in the chat again. Um, and then there's a big kind of on the page that she's going to link to, there's a big, you know, link to Finch um, button that you can press. And then once you're in there, you'll want to hit the C key to connect to a robot. Tom, can you see Brian's question uh, about his trying to draw triangles? Does it need motor adjustment? No. It should is my answer. <laughs> um, so were you trying to, I mean, the triangles seem to have come out. Were you um, keeping it, were you trying to have it draw exactly 
over top of one another, like over top of each triangle, or were you kind of moving it off yeah. slightly? Yeah, it just, um, I just did a loop of drawing triangles. Okay, yeah, it does seem to have drifted a little bit. Um, I'll look at that, but we haven't seen that really. I mean, they always drift a little, but this is a lot more than, than I would have expected. So, so, so how do you adjust it? When uh, I mean, I've got a firmware update that I haven't put on these yet. So that could be part of it. Um, but beyond that, I don't think you really could adjust it. It should just work. Okay, thanks. Could be the, um, the friction plus the pen. Not really. Hmm. Yeah, I'll look at it. Now it's not drawing at all. Yeah. Push it in. Try now. I don't have it now. Someone else oh, okay. has it. Yeah, that's why we went with the uh, paintbrush tips, which this one isn't, because you can squish them down, and then you know there's kind of more give in the tip than um, with a regular marker. And in a private chat, someone was. Um asking about grants. And so I thought I would post here just in case people don't know that we do have a grant assistance page, which links you to our media kit. So it has photos and logos. It also has a lot of text that um, people have used in previous grants about why computer science is important, why physical computing is important, details about our products. Um, and also li links to a lot of grants that we have found. Um, and so if you have a favorite grant that isn't up there, please let me know and I will add it to the page. Um, but really, we want to support you in any way we can in applying to grants for our products. Um, the, you know, the main reason that we have the Finch Robot Loan Program is that we understand that all schools cannot afford to buy robots. And it is really, really important to us that we build products that we really think will inspire and motivate and open kids' eyes. And we want every kid to have the chance to program a robot during their normal school day. So not only the kids that can do special programs or have parents buy them for them or only in school districts that can afford them. So it's really important to us to, um, to commit to having loaners. So, um, as I mentioned before, we do, we are learning out the Finch One robots right now. Um, this year is special because nobody knows what's happening <laughs> with their school year. <laughs> they're starting remote, they're going hybrid, they're starting one way, they're switching to another. So if you are interested in a Finch loan this year, Finch One robots, um, there is an application online. You can also um, just email us. Um, and we are working with people one on one this year. Usually, we very strongly recommend pair programming. Obviously, this year that can't happen in a lot of places. Um, so, we will work with you on what you need. And we are in 2021 going to be putting Finches into a Finch 2 loan program. We you know, we want to get these things here, get them all out to the pre learners and start shipping them to everyone before we commit to exactly when that program will start and what it will look like. Um, but you will hear about it on Twitter, Facebook, in the newsletter. Um, so please just, as long as you're in contact with us, you will hear about when the Finch 2s start getting loaned out in, um, in flocks. We will be starting a demo program as soon as the Finch 2s get here. So you will be able to borrow a single Finch 2 robot for two months to try it out. 
Um, and again, we'll be releasing info about that on social and on our newsletter. Um, so as soon as they're here, you can borrow one for two months and then we'll ask you to send it on to, we'll send you a label to send it on to the next educator that's borrowing it. All right, and we've got about three minutes left. So, um, you know, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and playing with the Finches. Um, I'll give you another minute or two if you want to do a final program or a final run to see, see what you've created. And um, yeah, I wanted to give everybody, a, you know, a good time limit warning because I know sometimes time can sneak up on us, especially in 2020. Time seems to be different than normal. <clears throat> How much time? Hey, Tom. Saying hi from Boston. Uh, hey. We're the one. We're in the F robot. Uh, we were oh, running cool. the same program on, I think, E earlier. It was not. Uh, I wasn't following any sensor, but it was. I was trying to do this like S type curve. Back oh yeah, forth. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it looked like it was doing like a figure eight. Um, cool. Yeah, it's good to Where's see you, Tom. Babe. All right, I, I hear somebody uh, trying to play music. Yeah, you can do that. We saw that with the Finch one also. A lot of Mario Brothers and Final Fantasy theme songs. Good 8-bit eight, eight music. All right, so we've just got uh, a minute or so remaining. So again, I wanted to thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks for playing with the Finches. Um, let me go to our slides. So if you want to learn more, um, there's an overview at that link as well as a purchase page. You can sign up to our mailing list so you can find out exactly when they'll be shipping um, and also find out when we'll be doing other events like this one with both finches and hummingbirds, um, as well as events where we kind of teach people how to make their own and do your own remote robots playground. Um, so yeah, that's it. I'm going to cut off the recording for now. Um, if you'd like to stick around for a couple minutes, Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, thanks for watching from everyone at BirdBrain Technologies.